And today we're going to be looking at the second covenant, which is the Adamic covenant. I nearly said the Abrahamic covenant. The Adamic covenant. And we're going to read uh, Genesis chapter 3, uh, from verse 9 through to verse 19. Genesis 3, from verse 9 through to verse 19. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden and I was afraid, because I was naked and I hid myself. And he, that is God, said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree? Wherefore, whereof I commanded thee that thou should not eat thereof? And the man said, The woman whom thou gavest me, She gave me of the tree, and I did eat. And the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. And the Lord God said to the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. And to the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow shall thou bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto thy voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree, of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shall thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shall thou eat bread, till thou return to the ground, for out of it wast thou taken. For the dust thou art, and unto the dust thou shalt return. Horrible passage, that. The fall of man. But we're looking at the Adamic covenant specifically today, so let's make a start. This second covenant is obviously between Adam and God. Adam here represents the whole of mankind, as he is the father of all that would come afterwards, isn't he? He's the father of all who would come after. The first fruit, if you like, of many brethren. Does that sound familiar? First fruit of many brethren. So he represents the whole of mankind. So then the judgment that would come on Adam would henceforth fall upon all who came afterwards. Man, woman and child. Now in this covenant God addresses four people. Or four characters, let's say. Number one, he addresses the serpent. Number two, he addresses Satan. Number three, he addresses Eve. And fourth, he addresses Adam. And I'll explain more about why I've put those down as we go through. But first, I want to look at the serpent. Now, it's obvious that God is talking to the serpent because he calls him a serpent. Now the word translated serpent here in verse 14 is actually the Hebrew word nachash. Nachash. And it means the following. It means a snake from its hiss, its hissing sound. And the root meaning is to hiss, to whisper, or to whisper a spell, to prognosticate, to foretell, to divine, to predict. That's the meaning the core meaning of this word, serpent. Which really would explain why this scripture, verse 1, says as it does. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Yea, as God said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden. The serpent was more subtle and it's pretty obvious when you see the root of of the name serpent, isn't it? Because that's, that's the definition of the word. It was subtle. It was, um, what's the word? 
divisive, let's say. It could also explain, in part, if only in part, why Satan chose to speak through the serpent in the first place. Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. But the fact that the serpent itself was more subtle, more crafty than any other beast of the field that God had created really verifies that fact, doesn't it? Of why the devil or Satan chose the serpent to speak through. Now the word itself, uh, Nachash, was used in Leviticus 19 verse 26. You turn with, that, with me to that and it will give you a little better idea of what we're talking about. Leviticus 19 and verse 26. You shall not eat anything with the blood, neither shall you use enchantment nor observe times. Now that word enchantment is that word nachash. Okay? So that gives you an idea of uh, what the serpent was like. Now then, in this curse uh, with, is contained within the contains Three stipulations, if you like. Three curses or three different stipulations. Number one, for this is for the serpent, by the way. The, the stipulation is about the serpent. Number one, it is cursed above all animals. And that's important. It's cursed above all animals. Because subsequently, all animals would be under the curse. As a result. But here, more specifically, it appears that the serpent is far more cursed. It's singled out to be more cursed, if you like. Uh, and it sort of speaks more about that. If you, if you go, we won't look at it now, but if you look at in uh, where God uses the serpent to, to bite the Israelites to trouble the Israelites. And then that brazen serpent is used to cause them to look up, to become healed. But he uses the serpent as a form of judgment. Okay, so that's, that's interesting there. The animals were made by God for the benefit of man. For the benefit of man. Remember, they were all bought before Adam to see who could make a, a helpmate for him. And none were found, so... Henceforth, Eve was brought out of man. But animals were made for the benefit and help of man. But when that uh, benefit is violated, God brings judgment. And that's why the serpent here was cursed above all animals. Number two, the serpent is now made to crawl along on its belly. So therefore, at first, it must have been upright in some way. I think that's pretty obvious, isn't it? We don't know what form it took. It took, I should say. But it's pretty obvious that in some way or other it was upright. And number three, the serpent shall eat the dust of the earth. Now according to the following scripture that I'm going to read, this would mean that the serpent was especially cursed. I think we covered that a minute ago. But I want to read these two scripture verses from Micah 7. Micah chapter 7, verse 16 and 17. And they say this. The nations shall see and be confounded at all their might. They shall lay their hand upon their mouth. Their ears shall be deaf. And 17 says, they shall lick the dust like a serpent. They shall move out of their holes like worms of the earth, they shall be afraid of the Lord our God and shall fear because of thee. Now interestingly it seems that this particular curse where the serpent will eat dust of the earth will actually remain even into the kingdom of Messiah. That's a pretty strong curse, isn't it? And we, we can see that from Isaiah 65 verse 25. 
you want to turn with me there you can if, if not you can write the scripture verse down Isaiah 65 verse 25 says this the wolf and the lamb shall feed together and the lion shall eat straw like the bullock and dust shall be the serpent's meat they shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountains saith the Lord so there it's, it's actually prophesied that the serpent will still eat dust at that time so it's a pretty strong curse on the serpent now I want us to look at Satan now it doesn't actually mention Satan in the scriptures does it but if you read them if you read them through with the knowledge of what we we have in the Lord Jesus Christ it's obvious that God is speaking to two different characters here he curses his uh, voice towards Satan who had caused the deception so let's look at uh, Satan verse 15 of our uh, chapter says this and I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed it shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel now this curse upon Satan really contains four different stipulations four different stipulations and we're going to go through them number one there's to be eternal hatred between the woman and Satan number two this hatred would seem to be cumulative if you like uh, it would build to an ultimate climax between on one hand Satan and his seed Antichrist and the woman and her seed Messiah that's the ultimate conflict isn't it that the last day will be between the Antichrist and the Messiah number three the serpent would bruise the heel of the woman's seed and we can see that in the crucifixion Satan thought he'd won a great victory over God by causing his son to see death but of course Jesus rose from the dead as we'll celebrate next week but he bruised the heel of the woman's seed at the crucifixion and number four that the woman's seed would crush the serpent's head now there's a partial fulfilment of that at the resurrection in the victory over sin and death I think you'll agree that. so there yeah, turn with me to Hebrews 2 if you will verses 14 and 15 Hebrews 2 14 and 15 <clears throat> Hebrews 2 14 for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood he also himself likewise took part of the same that through death he might destroy him that had power of death that is the devil victory over death and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage aren't you glad that you've been delivered from the power of sin and death and bondage hallelujah that's everyone in this room today who knows the Lord Jesus Christ however there will be an ultimate fulfilment at the end of the millennial reign of Christ the end of the millennial reign of Christ remember maybe you're not aware but the devil Satan, Lucifer will be chained in Sheol for a thousand years in prison but he'll be let loose at the end of that thousand years Revelation 20 verse 10 I'm not going to go there now but that's Revelation 20 verse 10 Paul alludes to this in Romans 16 verse 20 now we will take a look at that Romans 16 verse 20 I can find it Romans 16 verse 20 
and the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. You can all say amen to that. And the God of peace shall Satan under your feet. Isn't that good to know? Satan is going to be under your feet on that day. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. The word destroy, back there in, in Hebrews 2 verse 14, remember it said uh, destroy there is, is the word katargeo, katargeo, which means to render idle, to render idle, to cause a person or a thing to have no further effectiveness or to annul. That's what Jesus has done to Satan for you. For all those who are in Christ Jesus, he has made Satan ineffective to you. Isn't that wonderful? He's ineffective. He's still effective over those who don't know Christ as Saviour. They're still under his control, under his reign in this world. But to you who know him, are free from that bondage. He's been made idle, rendered idle, ineffective. He's been, his power has been annulled. Now the point being that the ultimate seed of the woman would be the Messiah, Jesus, Yeshua. Now this is actually contrary to the biblical norm, if you think about it. Because the line always came through the Father. You look at the genealogies, genealogies, and with the exception of Ruth, maybe, uh, and um, Rahab. Rahab, thanks, Deb, they're all men. The norm is for the, the lineage to come through the man, the male of the tribe. Yeah? But here, the Messiah would come through the seed of the woman, foretelling that God would be his father. And it sort of reminds me, in a way, of, of Romans 11:17, where it, where it speaks about the unnatural branches grafted back into the natural, or grafted rather, into the natural olive tree. The wild branches. It's contrary to nature. But God does it. It's amazing, isn't it? That, that picture there, that God, nothing is impossible with God. So really that, the, the, the prophecy there of saying that the Messiah would come from the seed of the woman is contrary to the biblical norm. It really shows us that it's going to be something incredibly special. That Jesus, the Messiah, would not be of a human father. Something revealed much later in scripture in Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14. Let's take a look at that. Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel, God with us. Wow, that must have stirred things a little when that was prophesied. Now this prophecy in, in Genesis 15 about the seed would lead really Satan to attempt to corrupt the line of the Messiah. He had to corrupt. In order to get a victory, he had to corrupt that line that would lead to the Messiah, didn't he? And we see in Genesis 6, verse 4, that there had been an attempt to corrupt the line. You know, the sons of God. I know there are many ideas about that, and the daughters of man, and giants, and all the things. Corruptions of, of God's creation. A plan that will eventually lead to the coming of the Antichrist. That's the ultimate corruption that Satan tries to bring. But that's the, that's the curse upon Satan. Now the woman 
comes next. Genesis 3 verse 16. Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow shall thou bring forth. Sorry about this, Kath. <laughs> In sorrow shall thou bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Eve as a result. Uh, would represent all of womankind as Adam represented of all mankind Eve as a result all of womankind would come under three stipulations or provisions here in this curse number one increased pain possibly and this is only possibly during menstruation but certainly through childbirth after the fall, a woman is able to conceive at least once a month. It may have been very different before the fall. Number two, the woman was to give birth in pain. Now before the fall, she would have presumably have been able to give birth painlessly. There is though joy in childbirth after the child is born. I want to read John 16, verse 21. John says this, A woman, when she is in travail, hath sorrow, because her hour is come. But as soon as she is delivered of the child, she remembereth no more the anguish, for joy that a man is born into the world. Now, personally, I haven't been through childbirth. I did, but in another concept. I haven't experienced what a woman experiences in childbirth. But I believe that this is, could be this joy that comes afterwards, this euphoria that the child is there, the child is born, the child is safe, the child is healthy. The rejoicing of the family is what is talked about when it says that the woman will be saved through childbirth. That word saved doesn't mean she'll meet Jesus. It means that she'll be saved from the pain there will be joy to make up for the pain that's good isn't it <laughs> keep that in mind <laughs> and number three the wife is to be subject to her husband now this was the case before the fall man was given authority they were both the same they were both equal but man had a different role to the wife. Man was the, the hunter-gatherer, if you like. The woman was to take care and raise the children. And all things. I know that sounds sexist to some. But that was the, they were the roles that God gave to man and to the woman. They're equal in his eyes. And always will be. But they each have a different role. Before the fall, the wife was subject to her husband. But now, the addition was that she would now have a desire to re rebel against that position of subjection. And rather rule over the husband. Can you see that? Can you, can you understand that? We can't go into it too deep because of time, but... I'll go through that again. The wife is to be subject to her husband. This was the case because the husband answers to God. The head of the man is God, is Christ. And the head of the woman, the covering, it means, when it talks of head. The covering of the woman is the man. The covering of man is Christ. The wife is subject to her husband. Now, this was the case before the fall but now in, the addition was that she would now have a desire to rebel against that position of authority. Of subjection rather. And rather to rule over the husband. And this is something that the, the devil, Satan, Lucifer, works on a lot in the world. You can see that in the world by various troubles. 
Now, moving on to the man. Because we're talking about the Adamic covenant here. Genesis chapter 3, verse 17 to 19. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns and thistles also shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return to the ground, for out of it thou art taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt remain. Both Adam and as a result all of mankind after him would now be subject to this curse and there are five different provisions or stipulations to this curse concerning Adam and man. Number one, because it was Adam here who represented the whole of mankind, it would be him alone who would bear responsibility for the human condition, not woman. Okay. Because it was Adam, I'll read, read that again. Because it was Adam here who represented the whole of mankind, through him would the curse come until the Messiah overturned it. It would be him alone who would bear the responsibility for the human condition. Pretty heavy weight to bear, I think, isn't it? To know that your sin would cause all mankind to come afterwards to be in sin and be separate from fellowship with God who created us. Number two, as a result of the fall, the earth was cursed. Now the fact that work was involved wasn't new. The, man that, the, the, the fact that man, Adam, had to work wasn't a new concept, was it? It wasn't a new stipulation under the curse Man had been given work to do to keep and tend the garden. That was his work. He was given work to do. But, as a result of the fall, the earth would not now respond the way it would have done before the curse. Before the fall, that is. Uh, it wouldn't respond as it had done under the Edenic Covenant. The first provision. Now it would bring forth thorns, thistles and weeds. You ever wonder where weeds come from? <laughs> thorns and thistles and weeds all come from the curse. They weren't meant to be there. But they were added to make man's labour harder. The diet number two, that is. Diet would remain as vegetarian. Although I noticed something here that was, seemed strange to me. When you look at the first provisions of what man was allowed to eat, of the trees of the field, remember? Fruit bearing seed of the tree, and herbs and all that. Not the animals, of course. That will come later. But, but here, all it says is that man would eat herbs of the field and bread. That's all that's stipulated in this curse. And I found that very strange. I don't know why it stipulates that, but that's all that God mentions here. He doesn't say anything about the trees, fruit bearing seed, but he just talks about the herbs. Let's, let's find out. Verse 18. Thorns and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. And then verse 19 it says... Uh, what does it say, the bread? Oh, yeah. In the sweat of thy face shall thou eat bread. So you have the herb of the field and bread. And that's all it stipulates in, those, in these provisions of the curse. So was he still allowed to eat of the tree? I don't know. It would appear, though, that the animals would still be for dairy, clothing and sacrifice. It wasn't still allowed to eat of the animals, but they would still be useful for 
for clothing, wool from the sheep and so on and so forth, milk from the the goats and from the cattle. And so the diet of mankind was, did stay mainly the same. Number four, man's work would now be characterised by hard labour. Any men recognise this? This wouldn't covenant. The first, when man was created, this wasn't to be the case. It was to be a pleasant work, a light work, where everything was working in harmony, one with another. Man truly in harmony with the whole of creation. But here, the emphasis now is on man's work being characterised by hard labour. Now, man would have to work hard and sweat to bring forth his harvest, to look after his family, to feed his family, and so on. Number five, the first mention of death here, physical death, which was the ultimate sentence, wasn't it? Resulting from the warning that had been given to Adam in Genesis 2, verse 17. As soon as you do eat of it, you shall surely die. We believe, it's believed that that first death was spiritual. Now, he speaks of the physical death that would occur. This is explained, I think, really clearly for us by the Apostle Paul in these last few scriptures I'm going to bring today. And if you want to turn to Romans chapter 5, verse 12 to 21, I'm going to read all of that portion. Romans 5, chapter 12, uh, sorry, Romans 5, verse 12 to 21. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and, by, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam unto Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come, that being Jesus. But not as the offence, so also is the free gift. For if through the offence of one many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. Not as it was, sorry, not as it was by one that that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offences unto justification. For if by one man's offence death reigned by one, much more, they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by the offence of one judgment, sorry, of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offence might abound. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life, by Jesus Christ our Lord. You know, there were only ever supposed, there were only ever two exceptions to this rule, where all would die because of sin. Those two exceptions were Enoch and Elijah. There will be many more at the Harpazo. As I stated before, previously, the ad- was. It was an unconditional covenant. God with man. There's nothing man could do about this one. 
It was God telling man how it was going to be because of sin. And it was, if you like, I I found a a quote here from uh, Dr. Arnold Fruchtenbaum and he calls this the basis for the dispensation of conscience. Because we have a choice whether to obey or whether to reject. Do we sin or do do we obey God's word and his way of escape? Meaning, of course, that we all have a choice to follow either that which is good or that which is evil. We all have that choice, don't we? Even now, we still have free will in Jesus Christ. We still have to decide either to follow or to disobey. So that really, in a nutshell, and a very small nutshell, is the Adamic covenant. Next time we're going to look at the Noahic covenant. But I hope that's, that's been of some use.